Good morning, colleagues, and a warm welcome to you. On behalf of the Director General, Human Resources, Ministry of the Public Service, and the Director of the Learning and Development Directorate, thank you for joining us in this webinar titled Investing. Please note that this presentation is being recorded. I am your moderator, Faye Ann Jordan, Human Resource Officer at the Learning and Development Directorate. Our presenter this morning is Mrs. Gail Worrell, Financial Planner, whom I will formally introduce to you after I have shared with you the guidelines for your participation in this webinar. We would like to hear from you and would like to include your voice in the conversation. But before we get there, here are some rules of engagement that we want to share with you as we begin the presentation. You would need to pause or minimize distractions as much as possible. Take some time to reflect on relevant issues that you may wish to share later. You can share your information, comments, queries using the Q&A icon located at the bottom of your screen. There will be a questions and answers segment at the end of the presentation where you are invited to post your questions in the chat to the panelists and they will be shared with the presenter who will respond by audio. Ladies and gentlemen, as mentioned before, your presenter today is Mrs. Gail Worrell. Mrs. Worrell is a seasoned professional financial advisor with a diverse skill set and a commitment to helping individuals and businesses achieve their financial objectives. With a half decade of comprehensive experience in the field, she has established herself as a trusted advisor in long-term investment strategies, savings, money management, risk management, and budgeting. Gail's area of specialization encompasses a wide range of financial services, and she takes a holistic approach to financial planning. Considering both short-term needs and long-term objectives to formulate comprehensive strategies that drive sustainable growth and prosperity. With a clientele of approximately 275 individuals and businesses, Gail has demonstrated her ability to cultivate lasting relationships built on trust, integrity, and genuine commitment to her client's success. Whether guiding individuals toward goal achievement or retirement planning, assisting families with estate planning, or supporting businesses in achieving their financial goals. Gail provides personalized solutions that align with her clients' unique circumstances and aspirations. Outside of her professional endeavors, Gail enjoys volunteering her time to promote financial literacy initiatives and empower individuals to make informed decisions about their finances. She firmly believes in the transformative power of education and strives to empower her clients with the knowledge and resources they need to navigate the complexities of the financial landscape with confidence and clarity. A warm welcome to Mrs. Worrell. It is a pleasure to have you present this information in this forum this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, I leave you in the capable hands of Mrs. Worrell. Mrs. Worrell, over to you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. Fian, I truly appreciate that. And I appreciate everyone that is on the call with us this morning. So before we get started today, I do want to, I do want to welcome you to our financial planning and investing educational session, because that's what today is going to be about. All right. So whether you are joining us from the comfort of your home or your office, we are excited to have you here. Now, in today's session, we are going to be diving into the world of financial planning and investing. 
exploring some of the key concepts and strategies that can help you navigate your financial future with confidence. All right, now these objectives of today's session are twofold. And the first is to demystify the often uh, complex landscape of financial planning and investing, breaking down some of the key concepts, some of the barriers, some of, and, and then empowering you to um, you know, be equipped with the knowledge that you need to make better informed decisions. And secondly, to equip you then with the practical skills and insights that can help you apply immediately to start building a stronger financial foundation for yourself as well as for your loved ones. Now, you may be asking, why is this session been put on by learning and development? Or why is it so important? Well, simply put, financial literacy, and I'm sure you would agree, is important in today's world, right? So whether you are just starting out in your career or whether you're planning for retirement or you're somewhere in between, having that solid understanding of financial principles is essential for achieving your own financial goals and securing your personal financial future. And further to that, with the ever-changing economic landscape here in Barbados and abroad, um, all over the world, and the multitude of investment options that are available to us, not just in Barbados, but um, internationally as well, we want it to feel easy. We don't want you to be overwhelmed. We want you to be sure of where to begin. But by investing in your financial education, it means then that you are taking the first step towards greater financial freedom and security. So as we embark on this educational journey together, I encourage you to actively engage and ask questions and absorb as much information as possible. Because the more, because the more informed you are, the better equipped you'll make um, some financial decisions that align with your goals and your aspirations. All right, so once again, welcome to Financial Planning and Investing, uh, this educational session this morning. And I hope you find today's discussion both enlightening as well as empowering. Now, we will have a Q&A segment at the end, as Fian would have mentioned. So I want to encourage you to utilize that. So uh, let us dive straight in. Now, the first thing that we want to cover this morning is the objective. What is to the, What are we going to be speaking about today? We want to understand what investing is. We want to understand the key terms and some concepts. We also want to clear the air on some misconceptions as well surrounding investing, right? We want to understand the purpose of investing, the reason, the benefits. We want to understand as well types of investments, especially for local investors. We want to understand when to invest based on your age demographic. We want to understand risk management diversification, the economical factors, and the impact that they can have for you. But before we go any further, I need your help. I want to understand or I want to find out from you if you believe you are in the right place right now and you have personal financial objectives, personal financial goals, and you have considered investing to help yourself achieve those goals, I want you to use the raise hand feature that's at the bottom of your screen. And let me see who thinks they are in the right place today. Fantastic. So I'm seeing a number of persons raising their hands. This is brilliant. So it means that you are engaged. It means that you believe that where you are is the right place to be based on what you have as your personal financial objects. And I hope that this remains the same at the end of today's session as well. All right, so let's get into it. What is investing? Investing, as it reads here, is the act of simply allocating resources, so typically money, right, with the expectation of generating an income or profit. And the core principle behind investing is to put your money into assets that are expected to grow in value over time, or generate income and thereby increasing your wealth. All right, so investing really aims to then build wealth and achieve your financial goals, such as retirement, such as buying a home, 
uh, funding education, and oftentimes it requires research. It requires planning. It, retires, it requires seeking advice from financial professionals in order to align the investments or the right investment tools with the individual, taking into consideration things like risk tolerance and the financial objectives. All right, so today what we will begin with is a few definitions. All right, and this is by no means to meant to insult your intelligence, but it's to help all of us all of the participants on this morning's call to understand and follow all of the components along the presentation. And by the end of today's session, have an understanding or gain a deeper knowledge that encourages you to make well-informed decisions and to take your first steps towards investing or review your investments to ensure that they are working for you. All right, so these are some basic investment terms and concepts which you will hear me using throughout today's presentation. And the first one is stock. All right, now stock is basically a, a type of security that signifies ownership in a corporation and represents a claim on part of the corporation's assets and earnings. The next one is bond. When you hear bond, we hear of government bonds, we hear of corporate bonds, et cetera. And what this is, is a fixed income instrument that represents a loan made by an investor to a borrower. So typically a corporate bond or governmental bond. And then we have neutral funds. This may be a common term for most of you on the call, right? But this is where an investment vehicle, this is an investment vehicle that pulls money together right, from many investors to purchase a diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, and other securities. Wealth. So a lot of individuals may say, well, you know, I want to be wealthy. I want to be rich. Um, but the true definition of this is really just the abundance of valuable financial assets or physical possessions, which can be converted into a form that can be used for transactions. So typically we would refer to it as cash. All right, dividend. This is a portion now of a company's earnings that are distributed to shareholders. And typically again, in the form of cash or additional shares. Capital gain, this is a term you may hear me use from time to time throughout the presentation today as well. And this is the profit that's earned from a sale of an asset like stocks, bonds, or even real estate, where the sale price exceeds the purchase price. So the difference between the sale price and the purchase price is referred to as capital gain. Volatility. This is where this is a statistical measure of the dispersion of returns for a given security or uh, market index, often associated with the level of risk. All right, so that's something that we wanna get into a little bit further in the presentation as well. Now you may hear the term diversification when it comes to investments and um, growing your wealth and your financial portfolio, et cetera. And what diversification really means is, is a risk management strategy that mixes a wide range of investments within a portfolio to reduce exposure to any single asset or risk. So you want to diversify your portfolio to ensure that your assets are not exposed to um, high losses, right, at any one particular point in time. The next one then is yield. This is really the income return on an investment, typically expressed as an annual percentage based on the investment's cost, current market value, or the face value. And then we have the term liquidity. This basically refers to the ease with which an asset can be converted into cash without affecting its market price. So maybe how quickly an asset can be cashed in or you can provide cash from that particular asset, all right? And then one that we hear a lot or maybe even see on some of the financial statements, et cetera, is return on investment. Sometimes we may see just three letters which, re which signify return on investment, which is ROI. 
And this is a measure used to evaluate the efficiency of an investment or compare the efficiency of several different investments calculated as the gain or the loss from an investment relative to its cost. All right, so these are some of the key terms and concepts which you will hear me use throughout the presentation this morning. Well, the next thing we want to get into and discuss is misconceptions. Investing is often surrounded by misconceptions, which can lead to poor financial decisions. So the first one, which can be very common, is that investing is only for the wealthy. You see, many persons believe that investing requires a large amount of money. But with the rise in online accounts, fractional shares, low fee index funds, investment, investing has become accessible to almost everyone, even those with modest amounts to begin. So you do not have to be wealthy in order to start to invest. All right, that's the first one. The second one is that, oh, you need to be an expert. You need to be an anoint all where investments are concerned. Now, while knowledge can certainly help, it is not necessary to be a financial expert to start investing. All right, so we need to make that clear because many successful investors use some simple strategies like buying and holding index funds. Some persons may invest in real estate to start. Some persons may invest in low fee index funds, mutual funds, things of that nature, which require minimal expertise. All right. The next one is that persons have thought in the past that investment is like gambling. Now, unlike gambling, which is based on chance, investing is about owning a piece of a business or an asset that has the potential to grow over time. Now, while there's a risk involved in investing, it is often manageable through diversification and a long-term approach. So you're looking at the bigger picture all the time. All right? Now, the other one is that past performance guarantees future results. Many, many investors believe that if an asset has performed well in in the past that it will continue to do so however the past performance is not a reliable indicator of future returns and so it's important to understand that research and understanding the fundamentals of any investment is something that has to be gained over time the fifth one here is that persons tend to want to wait until market conditions are better right? Time in the market. So they want to they want to try to predict market highs and market lows. And that is often extremely difficult, right? And often leads to sometimes worse outcomes than simply investing regularly over time. So there's a strategy known as dollar cost averaging, where you invest a fixed amount regularly and sometimes this particular strategy can mitigate the risk of market timing. The next one is that higher risk always equals higher returns. Now, while higher risk investments have the potential for higher returns, they also come with a chance or greater chance of significant losses. So it's then crucial and important to, to balance the risk and return based on your financial goals, right? And risk tolerance. Another one that I've heard from time to time is that oh, all debt is bad debt. Not all debt is detrimental to your financial health. Now, while high interest debt should be avoided, strategic use of that debt, such as uh, taking out a loan or maybe a mortgage, for a real estate investment can be beneficial if it is managed properly, okay? I've heard this one recently where individuals think that, you know, you need to constantly monitor and trade your investments. Now, frequent trading can lead to higher costs and taxes and potentially then eating into your returns or profits. 
a more passive approach like investing in low cost funds or stocks, et cetera, can, and, and holding them long term can often yield better results. All right. And then some individuals think that dividends are the only source of investment returns. Now, that could not be further from the truth. Right now, while dividends are a component, um, capital appreciation, which is, you know, increasing the value of an asset, also contributes significantly to overall returns. So both factors should be considered when evaluating investment performance. And the last one is you can get rich quickly. Investing is typically a long-term process. All right. Now, while some stories of overnight success are enticing, they are the exception and not the rule. All right. So consistent, disciplined investing over many years tends to be a more reliable way to build wealth. And so by understanding and overcoming these misconceptions, investors like yourself, can make more informed decisions and improve their chances of achieving their financial goals through investing. All right, now, why invest? Investing is crucial for financial health and security because it enables individuals to grow their wealth over time, outpacing inflation and ensuring their money maintains its purchasing power. All right. Now, by allocating funds into investments like stocks and bonds and real estate, et cetera, individuals can achieve higher returns, right, compared to traditional savings accounts. That's them being able to substantial, uh, building a substantial financial cushion. This, this growth then is essential for meeting long term financial goals, such as securing retirement income educational funding, whether it's for your, your, yourself, whether it's for your child, whether it's for your grandchild, etc. And then things as well like preparing for emergencies. And additionally, investing diversifies income streams, reducing dependency on a single source of income and obviously overall enhancing your financial stability. So what we need to look at now is the common types of investments. Now, these were selected as the common types of investments based on our jurisdiction. All right. Now, what we're going to do here is understand the definition of each of the bullets under the categories. Right. We're going to explain how it works. And then I'm going to give you an example. All right, so the first column or block, which refers to stocks, we want to understand what is growth investing. Now, growth investing focus on, focuses on buying stocks of companies that are expected to grow at an above average rate compared to other companies. So what investors have done and what they do is to look for businesses with strong potential for future expansion increasing revenue and profitability. Now, how this works is that individuals invest in companies that are in their growth phase. So these companies typically reinvest their earnings into the business rather than paying dividends and aiming to then expand rapidly. So for example, imagine planting a small tree or a seed that has the potential to grow into a large fruit bearing tree. And typically, fruit-bearing trees tend to have a lot of shade. Now, you won't get fruit and shade immediately from that tree. But in the long run, the tree could provide a significant amount of fruit and a significant amount of shade. All right? Value investing. Now, this involves purchasing stocks that are undervalued compared to their intrinsic value. So investors here, investors look for stocks that are trading for less than their actual worth as measured by fundamentals such as earnings and dividends or the steal per stock. 
And how this basically works is that individuals then analyze financial statements and other metrics to find companies whose stocks are undervalued by the market. They buy these stocks with the expectation that their prices will eventually reflect their true value. So an example of this is like shopping for items on clearance. All right. You find quality products that are temporarily discounted, expecting that the value will, re will be recognized later, which is then allowing you to benefit from the price increase. Because then what happens when you go to resell the product, or in this case, the stock or the bond, you will understand that the difference gives you the profit, but it takes time. Yeah? Dividend investing. This, this focuses on buying stocks again that pay regular dividends. So these are usually well-established companies with stable earnings that distribute a portion of their profits to shareholders in the form of dividends. So how this works is that investors seek companies with a history of paying reliable and increasing dividends, right? The, the income then that is generated from dividends can provide you as the investor with a steady cash flow or it can be reinvested to purchase more shares. So think of it like owning a rental property, for example, that provides a consistent monthly income. Now the property itself may appreciate in value over time, but you also benefit from a regular rental income. All right, so growth investing, is like planting a small tree that will grow large over time, provide you with the fruit and provide you with the shade. Value investing, shopping for high quality items on clearance. And dividend investing is like owning a rental property for a steady income. Now the next one we wanna look at is bonds. Government bonds are debt securities issued by a government so to support government spending and obligations. And these are, they're considered as low risk investments. Now, how this basically works is that individuals or companies may lend money to the government for a set period of time in exchange for periodic interest payments and the return of the bond's face value upon maturity. So, for example, imagine that you're loaning money to a friend who is very reliable. Now, they agree to pay you interest periodically and return the full amount that you lent to them at a later date. All right, corporate bonds now are debt securities issued by companies to raise capital for various purposes. So these, these corporate bonds typically offer a higher interest rate than government bonds to compensate for the increased risk. And how this one works is that investors lend money to corporations in which return the return promises to pay interest over the bond's term and repay the principal then at maturity. So for example, it's like lending money then to a business. The business then agrees to pay you interest regularly and return the principal amount at the end of the loan period. Whoops, sorry. All right. And then you want to move on to municipal bonds. <laughs> All right. So these are issued then by the state or county. These are not so much referred to in our jurisdiction. All right. These bonds often provide tax exempt interest payments. How these ones work is that individuals invest in these bonds to, pub to fund public infrastructure projects like schools and roads and hospitals and things of that nature. All right, so government bonds is like lending money to a reliable friend. Corporate bonds is like lending money to a business and municipal bonds is like lending money to your local government for a project. All right, now let's move on to real estate. 
which is sometimes a more common type of investment because it's something that you can actually see and appreciate. All right. Now, investing in rental properties involves purchasing real estate to rental to tenants. All right. The goal here is to generate income through rent payments and appreciate the property's value over time. So as we would understand, individuals buy residential or commercial properties and lease them out to tenants. The rental income can then cover the mortgage payments, cover things like property taxes, cover maybe even up to maintenance cost while potentially providing additional profit. So for example, think of it like buying a house and renting out to a family. All right, the rent that you receive helps then to pay for the mortgage and over time, the property may increase in value or it tends to increase in value. All right, now our EITs, this is referred to as Real Estate Investment Trust. These are companies that own, operate, or even finance income producing real estate across various property sectors. So whether it is residential, whether it is commercial. Now they offer a way to reinvest in real estate without owning physical properties. So how this one works is that investors purchase shares in the real estate investment trust, which then uses the pooled funds to buy and manage real estate assets. Now, real estate investment trusts are required to distribute a significant portion of their income as dividends. So, for example, it's like buying shares in a company that owns a portfolio of properties, such as things like shopping malls, office buildings, or apartments, where you can then earn a share of the income generated from these properties without actually or directly, directly managing them. All right. And then the last one is supposed to be real estate crowdfunding. All right, so that's my error there. Real estate crowdfunding involves pooling money from multiple investors and multiple individuals to fund real estate products. So it's like you and your friends come together and you pool your resources, you pool your money together to invest in real estate projects, whether that's townhouses, whether that's apartments, whether that's individual homes, whether that's commercial building. All right. Uh, how this one works is that it provides us with uh it provides us with a return, obviously, right, on that public infrastructure. Okay. Good. So let's just recap rental properties. It's like buying out a house, buying a house and renting it out. The real estate investment trust is like buying shares in a company that owns a portfolio of properties. And then real estate crowdfunding is like pooling money with others to invest in large property. All right. Now, let us have some fun. Let's engage a little bit and let's take it to the polls. Now, remember, as we participate in this poll, there are no right or wrong answers. On the next slide, you will see a screen appear with a question and some options. It will take about two minutes to read them through and you can select multiple options based on your current financial objectives. All right, so let's take it away. The question here is which of these financial objectives, right? The four bullets, which of these financial objectives do you think you would like to achieve through investing? So the first one is building wealth and achieving financial goals. You can select more than one, all right? Building wealth and achieving financial goals, securing retirement income, creating passive income streams, funding education, things like um, following your your educational path, getting a degree, a doctorate, etc., or even something as simple or as celebrity as major life events, weddings, anniversary celebrations, etc. 
All right. So you can choose more than one. And when you are finished, you can hit submit at the bottom. So I'm seeing quite a few responses coming in and it looks as though we have quite a few persons selecting one particular answer. So we'll share the results afterwards. Obviously, you wouldn't be able to see who has who has selected what, but it will give us a good idea of you are not in this alone. OK, there are other persons that share similar financial objectives to yourself. All right. So this is looking great so far. We are almost at 100% participation. Okay, fantastic. Now, I am going to go ahead once you finish selecting your choices and you've hit submit, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and share the results on the screen. Good. So now you're able to see here that 91% of the participants are interested in building wealth and achieving their financial goals through investing. Now, based on the information that I provided you with so far, investing can help you achieve each of these financial goals once the investment tools are aligned specifically with your financial objectives. All right. Well, the second one is that persons are interested on the persons who are on the call today are interested in securing retirement income. And that's a big topic. That's a huge topic in today's society. 68% of you are open to creating passive income streams through investing. All right. Funding education and major life events may not be at the top of the list, but it also helps you to understand that there are others who are also here on the call that have financial objectives in the same things as you. Okay. Now, let us keep it moving. All right. Building wealth and achieving financial goals. What does this really mean? Now, investing, as we know, it, is a key strategy for building wealth over time. All right. So by putting money into assets, such as stocks and bonds and mutual funds and real estate, et cetera, individuals can potentially earn returns that outpace inflation. Right. Therefore, they're then able to increase their net worth. So this growth enables investors to achieve specific financial goals like the ones we would have mentioned. All right, whether it's buying a home, investing in real estate, whether it's starting a business, whether it is traveling, funding education, et cetera, the list may go on. All right, securing retirement. One of the most common reasons for investing is to secure a comfortable retirement. You don't want to know that you've worked for 30 years, right? 40 years, and then you go home with 30% of your salary. Okay, we want to make sure that you have more than one income stream coming in. Sometimes even more than two income streams coming in to you when you retire. All right, creating passive income streams similar to, to securing retirement income, can come with investing in the right tools. So similar to what I would have mentioned before about investing in real estate, investing in rental properties, investing in stocks and bonds, whatever your financial objective is, there may be a specific investment tool to help you to achieve that particular goal. All right, you want to maybe take a look at dividend paying stocks, interest from bonds, Things, like, things of that nature. I've even heard of persons refer to uh, royalties from intellectual property, things of that nature. Now, these type of, in these type of income can supplement regular earnings, provide the financial stability that you're looking for, and offer a degree of financial freedom. All right? Now, funding, 
funding, education, and other major life events. While investments can be a way to fund the significant future expenses to education, etc., we want you to understand that savings plans and and um things like annuities and insurance policies and endowments and things of that nature could be great tools for individuals to use, right? Once it's aligned with your with achieving your financial objective or your financial goal. So by planning and investing early, it then becomes easier to manage some of the larger expenses without resorting to loans and other forms of debt. All right. So in summary, you want to understand that the, the primary purpose of investing is to build your wealth, secure a financially stable retirement, create passive income streams, and fund major life events. And that, there, that therefore comes with being able to plan. But it also starts with, with, with investing in your education. All right. Now we want to understand some of the reasons and then some of the benefits of investing. So the first thing here to understand is what wealth preservation has to do with investing. Wealth, pres wealth preservation and investing, what this does is it helps preserve the value of your money over time. So by placing money in assets that have the potential to increase in value or generate your income, can help protect your wealth, your income, your money from eroding due to factors like inflation and economic instability. All right. I well, you know during COVID, if not you, I certainly felt it, where we were able to visibly watch the price of things like gas and food items increase almost on a daily or a weekly basis. All right, you want to be able to mitigate those risks as much as possible through investing. All right, because investments have the potential to grow in value, right? Providing returns that you can significantly increase, that can significantly increase your overall wealth. So over time, investments in other appreciating assets can then lead to substantial financial growth, which is enabled enables investors like yourself to achieve your long-term financial goals. You want to beat the inflation, right? You want to beat, you want to beat inflation, guys, because inflation reduces your purchasing power of money over time. So investing in assets that typically yield returns above the inflation rate helps then counteract the effect. So we understand then the real return is that by investing in assets like same stocks and real estate and inflation protected securities, investors then can earn real returns, which are returns adjusted for inflation. So this then ensures that the value of your investments grow in terms of your actual purchasing power. Now we would have mentioned that there are some invest investments that come with risk all right but how do we reduce the risk as much as possible and this involves diversification spreading the investments across different asset classes so asset classes then would be things like stocks and bonds and real estate and commodities things of that nature to help to reduce the risk and this strategy really helps mitigate the impact of poor performance in any single investment or asset class so that then you can benefit from stable returns. So a diversified, a diversified portfolio is less likely to experience extreme volatility than leading to more stable and predictable returns over time. So we hear the term all the time, putting your eggs in one basket or not putting your eggs in one basket. Right. So by not putting all your eggs in one basket, investors then can achieve a balanced risk reward profile. 
All right, we want to then take advantage of compounding returns. So compounding returns occur when the earnings on an investment generate their own earnings or profit. And over time, this process can lead to exponential growth on an investment. All right. And then the benefit of that, obviously, is long-term growth because the power of compounding is particularly evident in long-term investments. The longer the investment period, the greater the potential for compound, in this in increase, compound interest to significantly increase the value of the investment, making it a powerful tool then for building your specific um, wealth portfolio. Yeah, so you may be on the call, you may be wondering, well, when would be the best time to in, in, invest? So we're going to go through age 20s, if you're early in your career, age 30s, age 40s, and even beyond age 50. So you can get an idea of what may work best for you. However, we would understand that each person's financial objective and each person's circumstances and scenarios in life will differ. So this is just to be used as an example, something that you can just, you know, consider. So investing in your 20s, the emphasis here on growth is on growth and risk tolerance. So stock markets, you want to take a look maybe at investing in stocks or equity-focused mutual funds, which can offer a high growth potential over a long period of time. Obviously, we want to understand from inception, what your financial objectives are, right? And also understand what your timelines or your time horizons are for achieving that specific goal. Yeah? In your 30s, you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're balancing the growth and the stability. You want to also take a look at diversifying your portfolio across different asset classes, right? to help to mitigate risk. You wanna start then to take a look more seriously now at retirement accounts. You wanna understand what your um, contributions towards private pensions may look like, your individual retirement savings accounts may look like, and then take advantage of tax advantage savings or accounts. You may be interested also in purchasing property or investing in real estate that can add to the stability and diversification of your portfolio as well. All right, so these, these things like mutual funds automatically adjust asset allocation based on your target retirement date or your target financial objective date. So you gradually then shift towards a more conservative investment as you approach the target date. Things like annuities, you may want to consider um, investing in annuities or investing in um, insurance or endowments, things of that nature. All right. When you get to your 40s now, this is where persons may say, well, this is my, this is now a midlife type of um, time frame. And this may not be the, this may not be the, the case for everybody because some persons may have children. And so they're still, they're still, you know, living life and growing with children. So they still have their career ahead of them. But you're also considering what happens with my child. How do I prepare for my child's education? How, what do I consider if I have children? What do I consider if I don't have children? All right. If you have children, you want to maybe consider in investing in educational savings. You want to prepare for college expenses, things of that nature. If you do not have children, then you may want to also expand your portfolio, or diversify your portfolio, taking into consideration what your financial objectives would be, whether it be real estate, whether it be a different form of investment. Right? And in your 50s, you want to transition to a more conservative method of investing. So you may want to take a look at bonds or fixed income investments to reduce portfolio volatility and preserve your wealth or your capital. 
All right. You may also want to start understanding what your retirement income will look like. Take a look at Social Security, NAS. Understand what your pension, uh, your pension income will look like. All right. Do some research on withdrawal strategies for retirement accounts to ensure that the sustainable income lasts throughout retirement. Because there are some expenses that you may not have in your 60s, but there are some expenses that you definitely will have in your 60s, in your 70s, and even in your 80s. So what you want you to understand here is that regardless of your age, it is important to understand and to regularly review and adjust your investment strategy based on the changing circumstances based on market conditions, based on your financial goals. So you may want to consult them with a financial advisor, maybe a financial planner, um, so that they can provide you with personalized guidance tailored towards your specific situation. All right. Now, there are a few things here that we will go through very quickly, just so that we're understanding then what the risk can look like based on investments. So understanding the different types of risk, market risk, this is the risk involved in losing value due to the movements in the overall market, such as factors that can be, um, that can be considered as economic conditions, interest rates, geopolitical events that can affect market risk. All right, interest rate risk now, this is investment sensitive to interest rate changes like bonds, face this type of risk. When interest rates rise, bond prices typically fall and vice versa. And then credit risk, this is the risk of loss from a borrower failing to repay a loan or meet contractual obligations. So therefore, this is, this is most common now in corporate bonds or even loans. And then there's liquidity risk. This, this mainly refers to the risk of not being able to buy or sell an investment quickly without significantly affecting its price. So investments in a less liquid asset like real estate or certain stocks carry a higher liquidity risk. Then we have the risk of inflation. Inflation may not keep up with the investments, may not keep up with the place of inflation. Inflation resulting then in a decrease in purchasing power over time, which you would have seen certainly during the COVID-19 period. All right, currency risk for investments denominated in foreign, foreign currencies, fluctuations in exchange rates can affect these type of returns. And then we have a political and regulatory risk. Right, these changes in government policies and regulations can impact impact investments, especially in sectors that are heavily regulated by government. Diversification now, diversification risk is a management strategy. So diversification really involves spreading investments across different asset classes, like we would have mentioned before, uh, stocks and bonds, real estate, et cetera, industries and geographic regions. And so by doing that, the impact of a poor performance in one investment or sector is mitigated then by potential gains in others. So diversification reduces the overall risk in a portfolio without sacrificing the potential returns. The importance of asset allocation here involves deciding how to distribute investments among different asset classes based on factors like investment goals, risk tolerance, the timelines, et cetera. So it's crucial uh, that this component of their portfolio construction as it determines the risk return profile of the portfolio. So a well-balanced asset allocation can help investors achieve their financial goals while managing risk effectively. All right, and then risk tolerance assessment, you wanna understand what risk tolerance refers to. And this is basically an investor's ability and willingness to endure fluctuations in the value of their investments. So by assessing risk tolerance, this involves now considering factors uh, like investment goals, 
time horizons, your financial situation, which may fluctuate from time period to time period, and the emotional temperament. So understanding your risk tolerance helps in selecting the appropriate investment tools and constructing a portfolio then that aligns with your comfort level. All right. So there are some tips that I want to leave with you. Tips that are, I want to say, require careful planning and execution. All right. The first one is to start early and stay consistent. Time is a powerful, powerful alley in investing due to the compounding effect. The earlier you start investing, the more time your money has to grow. Remember we said at the beginning, this is a long-term, this is a long-term thing, okay? The act of consistently doing it over time. The more... The con consistency is also key because regularly investing smaller amounts over time can accumulate significantly over time. All right. Now, I also want you to conduct thorough research before investing. So before committing your money to any investment, it's important to thoroughly research and understand the investment vehicle, the risk, and the potential returns and how it fits into your overall investment strategy. This obviously may include analyzing a company's fundamentals for stocks, understanding the bar, bar, bond um, issuers' credit worthiness for bonds, and evaluating the market conditions for other assets like real estate and commodities. Avoid emotional decision-making. Emotional decisions driven by fear or greed can lead to impulsive actions, all right, that, that may, in the long run, harm your investment portfolio. So it's essential then to stick to your investment plan and not be swayed by short-term market fluctuations or things that may look enticing for a short period of time, right? Having a clear strategy and staying disciplined can help you avoid making decisions based on emotions. Then re regularly review and adjust your investment portfolio. Market conditions and financial goals will change over time. All right. So it is essential to review your portfolio regularly. Rebalancing your for portfolio uh, periodically can help you maintain the desired um, asset allocation and mitigate some of the risks that may come up from time to time. So in addition to these tips, I want you to understand your risk tolerance, all right? Um, it's essential to invest in assets that match your risk appetite as taking on, you know, too much or sometimes even too little can impact your investment returns and overall your financial well-being. Asset allocation obviously plays a huge role in managing risk and diversifying your investments across different asset classes can help to reduce the impact of market volatility on your portfolio. So overall, successful investing requires a combination of starting early, staying disciplined, conducting thorough research, managing those emotions, regularly reviewing your portfolio, right? and aligning your investments with your risk tolerance and financial goals. And by following these simple principles, you can then increase your chances of achieving your long-term investment success, your long-term financial obligations, your long-term financial goals. All right, so towards taking steps towards investing is a fantastic decision that can pave the way for your financial future. Now, remember at all times you are building for tomorrow. Now, not literally tomorrow, but you are building for the long term. So when you're thinking of investing, don't just think about today. Don't just think about the next 24 hours. Don't just think about next week and next month. Understand that you're actively building wealth for your future self. All right? At every step that you take, is a step towards financial freedom and security. 
learn as you grow. Investing is not just about money. All right, it's about learning and growing as an individual. You gain some valuable insights into markets and businesses and economic trends that will help to um, enrich your understanding of the world and how it operates. All right, overcome those challenges. In investing can be intimidating, but remember that every successful investor started somewhere. So by taking the initiative to learn as you are today and start investing, right? You're already overcoming one of the biggest hurdles. Take advantage of the compound interest, right? One of the most powerful forces in investing is compounding interest. Even small investments today can grow significantly over time thanks to the magic of compounding. Diversification, investing allows you to diversify your assets and spread the risk, which can help protect you against market uh, highs and lows and economic uncertainties. And you wanna make sure that investing helps with goal achievement. So whether it's to buy a house, whether it's to retire comfortably or traveling the world, right? Investing can help you to achieve your long-term financial goals. And then remember that you are joining a community. And when I say joining a community, there's, there's a vibrant community of investors out there who are passionate about sharing knowledge and supporting each other, right? So by investing, you're joining this community and you're contributing to its collective wisdom. And remember that every journey starts with a single step. So as you keep learning, stay patient, stay focused though, on your goals. I came across this quote in preparation for today's presentation where it reads, invest for the long haul. Don't get too greedy and don't get too scared. Ladies and gentlemen, before we go into the question and answer segment, I wanna take this opportunity to personally thank each of you for participating in today's investing webinar. The future is bright. The future is as bright as your first step. Let me dare to say that, right? And at this time, I wanna say thank you to our host, Ms. Fianne Jordan. And at this time, I wanna open the floor, hand it over to her to lead us through the question and answer segments. If you've had any specific questions to your current financial objectives, you can either leave them in the question and answer, or you can direct them to Ms. Jordan so that they can be answered directly and privately after the session. We don't wanna hear from you. We wanna open the floor at this point in time for questions and answers. And I definitely saw some of them come in during today's presentation as well. So Fian, over to you. Thank you, Gail. And for your thorough presentation on investing, the information presented is on pros of healthy financial planning and investing. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached our questions and answer segment. It's over to you to engage our presenter with your questions. Please place the questions you wish answered in the question and answer box provided at the bottom of the screen. And I will relate to Ms. Wurl, who will respond by audio. Okay, so Ms. Wurl, we have the first question here. What investment options are there in Barbados for small investors? This is a this is a really great question. I'm glad I saw it come in almost at the beginning of our presentation, actually. So the first thing I want to say here is that small investors is relative. Because you could be an individual, you can be a small investor in terms of um, contributory investing, all right? But there are investment options that are available in Barbados 
where based on your risk tolerance, based on your financial objectives, you want to understand first and foremost what your time horizons are. So for example, let's give, let's give an example. If you are in your late 20s, you're, you're, let's say, for example, 30, right? And you have a financial goal of owning a home in the next five years, the next seven years. So by age 35, age 37, somewhere around there, you want to own your own home. Now, what comes along with that, right? Now, typically, owning your first home, maybe, you need to have something called startup capital. Depending on if you're going for a mortgage or a loan to buy or build, some financial institutions will require a few things. One, they may require a down payment, depending on if they're offering 90% financing, 95% financing, things of that nature. There are some institutions right now who are offering 100% financing. So that'll be part two of the answer to the question. If you're using a financial institution that's offering you 90% or 95%, what does this mean? It means that you need to have at least five or 10% of the down payment so that you can, so it can help you to qualify for the mortgage or the loan. So for example, if you're 30 and you know in five to seven years, you need you, you can qualify for, let's say for example, 400,000, you know you need to have at least five or 10% of that 400,000 in order to qualify for the mortgage. Now 10% of 400,000 is 40,000, 5% of that would be 20,000. Okay, now how do you generate 20,000 or 40,000 in five years? The first thing that it requires is something called discipline. Okay, now if you were to do a very simple calculation, $40,000 in five years is $8,000 per year. If we break that down monthly, that comes to somewhere around $660 and change. Now, you want to look at a short-term investment tool where you can say, okay, well, let me put in $600 or let me put in $500 and something dollars per month that can allow me to generate or save or accumulate with interest, compounding interest, the balance so that I can reach my target of 40,000 at the end of the five year or the seven year period. Now the research that we would have to do for that individual is to understand what the best investment short term tools are to help that individual to reach that financial goal in the, in, in the time frame, whether it's five years or seven years. So you may wanna look at something that is maybe like a savings account, you may want to look at a short-term mutual fund. You may want to take a look maybe at, um, I know some of the credit unions offer um, savings accounts that have a pretty decent return, right? Um, so think things of that nature. So you want to look at investment options, but you also want to take a look at time horizons. Now, for the individual who is unable to um, save $600 per month and they prefer to go, so this is part two of the answer, prefer to go the route of 100% finance. And they also want you to understand that while the institution may offer you 100% financing, that's fantastic, right? But there are also some upfront costs that need to be considered when home ownership is the goal. So you have things like valuations that still need to be encountered. You still have you still have um, the expense of hooking up water and electricity. All right. You still have the expense of land surveying. You still have the expense of um, some of these upfront costs that may come up that the mortgage, 100 percent mortgage may not take care of. So it may be in your best interest to still have. $10,000, sometimes $15,000 puts aside in that five-year period. If you can get $20,000 saved, save five. 
If you can't get $40,000 saved, save 20. All right, because then if the bank allows you in this scenario of home ownership to have a 100% mortgage, there are other things that will come along the way. There's property maintenance. You may move in the property and everything goes well, toilet breaks down, the fridge breaks down. Something happens in your very first year, all right? Savings is important and investing can help you do that once it's in the right financial uh, tool. All right, so I hope that that helps to answer that question. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Warrell. Our next question is, how can an individual invest in the Barbada Stock Exchange? And what is the process? All right, so the Barbada Stock Exchange, as far as I am aware, that is a um, public slash private uh, entity where you are able to call in, you're able to go in and you're able to ask questions about the Barbados Stock Exchange, but know what particular stocks um, are available to be invested in and what the process looks like. You can, you can go to the exchange office. You can also call in, you can sit and have a conversation with one of the um, advisors, one of the um, individuals that are there and they can advise you on what is the best tool, right, to utilize in terms of um, investing in the Barbados Stock Exchange. All right, so that process is actually pretty, pretty simple. Yes, please, thank you. Our next question is, which investment produced the compound interest? Which investment produces compound interest? So you do have um, you do have certain types of mutual funds which can be offered typically maybe by uh, insurance companies. And you also have, depending on the fund and the type of product, can also be offered by the credit union as well. All right. So I know that for some insurance companies, it depends on either the product or it depends on the fund that their mutual funds are invested in. Or again, here for companies like those, their mutual fund and their stocks, et cetera, are diversified. All right. So if you're looking at compounding interest, you want to take a look at diversification, where it is invested in and the type of product that will give you the highest return at the lowest cost, all right? Some individuals, some, some companies, sorry, actually provide you with a breakdown or provide you with a projection. Some companies do not. So you have companies maybe like Fortress that you can obviously, you know, go to. Again, you can call, you can do your research, right? You can check out the website. You can check out financial statements. You can attend some of their... Um, by annual events where they're able to share information in the public forum, right? So that you're able to gather that information before you make any steps to invest. Some investments though, what I would say is it does not require a consistent contribution. So some investments, again, you may be able to make a lump sum, you may be able to make a one-time payment, sometimes three or four payments per year, but does it benefit you? If it does benefit you, then a component interest, you want to take a look at the risk that are involved in that particular product or that particular fund. All right. So again, here, you 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 should really be doing your research. Obviously, as a financial advisor, these questions that may come depend specifically on a person's financial goals and their financial objectives. All right. Yes, please. Thank you. We have another question here. Um, what guidance would you give to mature investors or persons interested in investing late in life, for example, approaching retirement? What type of investments would you recommend? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a great question. 
Um, I think you would have mentioned during the presentation that for mature investors or persons that are approaching retirement, you may want to take a look now at your overall portfolio, take a look at if this is not the first time you're investing, of course, you want to take a look at your retirement, your savings accounts. You may want to take a look at um, policies that you may have had in place from before. You may want to take a look at understanding your social security, understanding if you are due things like maturity, right? So that you are able to invest in what I am most familiar with as a great investment tool is something called an annuity. And annuities and how these work is where you exchange a lump sum of income for a monthly pension payment, where that acts as a as a pension that is paid directly to you, but it is not taxed monthly. All right, so. An annuity might be an option for mature investors, persons that are like are approaching retirement, where they are able then to um, invest in an annuity to be able to get that um, stable flow of steady income coming into them as soon as they retire. Now, annuities are not based on uh, pensionable age right, which is right now set at age 67. So I'm doing annuities allow retirees to retire from as early as age 60 or as early as age 62, depending on, you know, which company you're using, et cetera. Um, and in addition to that, it helps also form a portion of steady cash flow until you have retired or you're, you're eligible for social security benefits in the form of um, NAS pension. Whereas NAS pension now begins at age 67, you're then maybe able to receive that steady flow of income from as early as age 60 or age 62. So again here, this is one of the suggestions, right? Um, but if, you are, if you're not some person who has invested from early in life, what this will require now is being able to look at something that may require a, a larger sum of contributions and the fund or whatever you're investing in, if it's more than one thing or more than one type of investment, is to understand that hopefully then the costs are as low as possible so that your profits are still relative or still significant so that you still benefit when you do choose to retire at whatever age. All right, I hope that that answers that question. Yes, please, we have time for one more question. And it is, how can you get into investing with a revolt partner investors in properties to gain additional income after property costs are covered? Okay, going to ask you, Fian, to just repeat the question for me. Okay, no problem. How can you get into investing with or without partner investors in properties to gain additional income after property costs are covered? Okay, so if I'm understanding this correctly, you may have finished, the individual may have asked this question, you, you have finished paying maybe for the property, if it was through a mortgage, if, if that's property, if that you're referring to that as property cost, and you want to know, start to invest with or without a partner, right? Um, in property to gain additional income after property costs are covered. So again, here you can you can look into renting out the property, right? Where you maybe you may want to divide it into apartments. You may want to take a look at renting it out as an entire property, furnishing or unfurnishing the property, 
uh, which helps to increase the value as, as well. That way then you're investing because if you the mortgage has been finished, let's say for example, the mortgage cost was $2,000 per month or $3,000 per month, and you can get it rented out for $3,500 per month. Seeing that the mortgage may be finished already, you then have that income stream of $3,000 or $2,000 consistently that then helps take care of maintaining the property and then whatever is left over after taxes have been paid, et cetera, is now what is considered as your monthly income stream. So that's part of what would what would be considered as an investment into the property. Not necessarily something that you have to go into with a partner. What that also helps to do is provide additional income so that if you did want to go now to purchase another property, you have that to use as collateral. All right, so I hope that that answers that question. But these are great questions, guys, and it also helps me to understand you've been listening today and the questions that you are coming forward with means that you're also thinking about the next steps. You're thinking about what your financial future looks like and what how your, how your financial objectives and your goals can be achieved through investing. All right, so these are some great questions that have come in this morning. Fian, thank you so very much for asking those questions and going over them. And I want to thank each of you for participating in today's uh, segment, as well as the question and answer section as well. Yes, please. Ladies and gentlemen, our Q&A time is now up. Thank you for your questions, comments, and queries. Mrs. Worrell will endeavor to share the responses to those unanswered questions, and they will be shared via email. We ask you to please complete our participant feedback form. A link is provided in the chat. We value your responses as they are very important to us at LED, as they assist us to enhance our delivery of these informational sessions to you. As you complete your form, I take this opportunity to thank Mrs. Worrell on behalf of the Director General, Ministry of the Public Service, and the Director of the Learning and Development Directorate for presenting this very valuable information. Colleagues, thank you for joining and participating in this webinar on investing. I trust that this information has given you the tools required to proceed with your investment opportunities. And I wish each of you much success in your future endeavors. To the Learning and Development Directorate team, I extend sincerest thanks to you. Working behind the scenes, my co-host and producer, Ms. Sheila Grisette, Senior Human Resource Officer. Colleagues, I wish all of you a very safe and productive remainder of the day. But before you go, please complete the evaluation form. We look forward to hearing from you. And Dale, once again, thank you tremendously for facilitating on this topic. We have truly enjoyed the information you have shared. And we do look forward to beginning our investing journey. It has certainly been my pleasure, Fian. Thank you as well. Yes.